You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcast on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for March 5th, 2021. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the world headquarters of the Cornfield Resistance, where Dr. Seuss, really? This is all you have left in your wingnut bullshit cannon? It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. Don't forget about Mr. Potato Head, Drift yeah. Glass. Well, Seuss has pushed Tater Head out of the uh, out of the headlines, which is a <laughs> real shame. Yeah, um, you know, I uh, I don't I don't even want to know where Dora's going to explore next at this rate. <laughs> um, I, all I know is. That that we are both winning and losing. Right. Right. Um, I think that's I, I titled this episode in our notes, you know, the battle continues. Yes. And I think we all felt a sense of winning the presidential election was going to be such a relief. And it is. And winning back the Senate was going to be such a relief. It and now is. finding out, oh, there's actual Democrats voting against the minimum wage increase today. Yeah. And what the hell? What is going on? No. Uh, mm -hmm. and, politics. and politics is going on. Exactly. Um, I'm reminded um, of the Supreme Court during the whole Obamacare, which now they're just sick of. They just look right. at the lawyers for this and say, we are not deciding this anymore. But back in the day when the Supreme Court was being asked by Republicans to rescind huge parts of Obamacare. Yeah. And, you know, the Roberts Court upheld, said it's a tax and therefore it can go through. Yep. Um, I didn't realize for many months afterwards how much negotiation was going on behind the scenes. And we'll give you this case because yep. they're all looking at all of the cases in the docket. Right? right. Right. And OK, we'll go along with this one and and so and so will vote yes on this. And but we'll uphold this health care for everybody. Mm -hmm. And. Roberts at that time, the claim was that he had concern for the standing of the court and that the court would be seen as illegitimate if they took away health insurance from 20 million people. Right. History which, will record. Yeah. History will record yeah. that they did this. And uh, it may have been that or it may have been just a deal. Yeah. And right now there's a 50-50 Senate and there are deals being made. Yeah. And. Everyone in that Senate chamber, you know, most of them multimillionaires, mm -hmm, most of them. aren't thinking about their next paycheck or their next meal. They're no. thinking about their next primary. That's all they yes. care about is their yeah. next primary. And that is incredibly frustrating to those of us who give a shit about whether poor people have meals. You know, that oh, yeah. that is yeah. just it, it is infuriating to see this going on. But it is. this is the government we have right now. And. I'm just trying to sort of step back when I can mentally and emotionally and say, OK, yeah, you know, OK, what is Sheldon Whitehouse saying today? What is Sherrod Brown saying today? What is Rachel, uh, Rachel Maddow saying today, for instance? What is um, uh, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders? What are they doing? What hey, is Dick happening? Durbin. Hey, we Dick just, Durbin. We can just go. He's like he lives to a mile and a half from here. So we can Tell just go over to his house. Can, Smack him. Yeah. <laughs> What's no violence. Him? No violence. Well, and let's let's remember how <laughs> yeah. Vermont got all of those lovely rural health centers. Yeah, right. From the Sanders Center. San the Sanders Bernie Center. Sanders negotiated for that. Just, he's put the squeeze on Barack Obama. Yeah. And, yeah. And the, as, right. that's how it works. I mean, this the yeah. thing that, yeah. that I I uh I, I thought of today was, you know, in my mind it's not this simple. I understand that. But you you demand twenty, you reluctantly settle for fifteen. And I just wonder if any of these people ever spent a minute on Maxwell Street in Chicago during its heyday, you know, haggling over rims and mm -hmm, CDs mm -hmm. and everything else and pantyhose and bras because that's how shit works. That's how it's worked in the marketplace forever. Mm -hmm. You don't – and it's But it's hard – when you want something so badly and you've waited so long. Oh, yes. Oh, no. no. Um, That's the worst I was, time to negotiate. Was, That's yeah, why you don't shop I was, hungry, I was reading you know? uh, a Twitter stream from, and I'm sorry I don't remember the name of the person, but this person used to work for Harry Reid. Mm -hmm. 
And he said, you guys don't understand how different the Senate is today oh, yeah. from what it was when I was helping Harry Reid and everything was getting blocked all the time. Yeah. And this is amazing. I am so optimistic about the future because mm-hmm. people are talking in a different language than they were then. Mm -hmm. The Republicans can't block everything. And when they block things, people are paying attention. And yes, I'm furious with the Democrats today who voted against the $15 minimum wage. Uh, I hope they're held accountable. I hope they uh, understand how angry we are about this, Mm -hmm. the activists. Uh, But I'm not giving up. And I don't think Bernie Sanders is giving up. I don't think uh, the Progressive Caucus in the House or Senate are giving up. Nope. Um, and this is good. this whole milieu is going to be on the ballot in 2022. And uh-huh. Republican primaries are apparently going to be about bathroom bills and whether transgender people get to be on women's sports teams and rather Dr. than Seuss and jobs Dr. Seuss and, Dr. and health care. Yeah. And Dr. Seuss rather than mm-hmm. jobs and health care. Yes. Because people care a lot more about Mr. Potato Head than they do about their health care. And their job. Jobs numbers came out today. Uh, over 300,000 do- jobs added, mostly in the hospitality industry, mostly in the uh, travel and hospitality industries, because they're gearing up yes. for when these shots go into people's arms <laughs> that everybody's going to want to take a trip. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and, and in the, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, mm-hmm. um, we're going to hit that point right around the time when summer vacation should be It, it appears and, that way. I yeah. am telling <laughs> myself that still... Yeah. That I'm getting a shot in uh, late August. Yes. I'm just mentally not allowing myself any hope beyond that. Right. Because I don't want to be disappointed. I don't want to be that person who says, oh, shoot, I didn't get my shot in May. I I am happy to be at the bottom of the list. We work at home. Right. We can handle it. You know. Wait a minute. You know, no, no. We no we're essential workers. <laughs> Uh, we're liberal podcasters, <laughs> liberal podcasters in the Midwest. Let's be very liberal clear about that. Are very in the rare are creatures. Essential workers, and, and I think, yeah, and and of course, well, wait a minute. We do our podcast out of our home, so that kind of shoots my own theory. Well, down, and that's it? my point is, yeah. you know, I I don't mind being the last one to get a shot if as long as people are getting shots and it's moving yeah. forward. Uh, that said, um, the economists, according to several uh, newsletters I got in the email today for work. Uh, economists are preparing for a 1920s boom. Yeah, you know, roaring 20s. The roaring, roaring 20s. 20s. Yeah. yeah. No, no. I, I um, think that's not a And if that's the case in 2022, uh, you're gonna. I don't see this being. Oh, I. It really bothers me when when I see people on Twitter say, "Well, the midterms are over. <laughs> it's yeah. like we haven't started fighting yet." And We're doomed. remember, remember what? And my TV husband said that today. Remember what? the Republican primaries are going to look like. Yeah. It's going to, it's going to be more Marjorie Taylor greens and QAnon and yeah. Mr. Potato head. And we're also going to wait until the bottom of the list. Cause we don't have a quarter of a million dollars to give to our governor. <laughs> Which our former governor gave to the current governor of Florida as a campaign contribution. When his gated community on the Florida keys got immunizations for everybody. Yeah. They're on an island. Yes, they are. And I wish that island were, I don't know, the, the one on Lost, perhaps, where <laughs> it just, you crank a wheel and they disappear. Mm. Um, I, wasn't he supposed to be in Italy? I mean, wasn't that the plan? Yeah, he, he was, was supposed gonna... to. Well, and I can understand why not going to Italy during the pandemic was, was put the kibosh on it. But he sure. wound up in the Florida Keys. This is governor, former governor of Illinois. We call him Governor Hedge Fund. It's Governor Rauner, former mm-hmm. Governor Rauner. Disgraced former now lives Governor Rauner. Disgraced former disgraced governor. One term former governor, Republican. One term Bruce union buster. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, terrible governor. Terrible, terrible governor. Uh-huh. And if uh, he were still no here. Budget for two years. And yeah. If he were still here, there'd be masks, you know, maskless Mondays. Maskless Mondays. And uh, there would also be no budget. Right. And we wouldn't have a, we wouldn't have an immunization plan in place in Illinois because there would be no state budget to do right. it. Yes, I, I love your take on this, Drift Glass. What's that? Um, Politico is now me- mentioning that there's such a thing as Biden Republicans. Oh, They're God. just like Reagan Democrats, exactly oh, the same. <laughs> no, they're not. No, they're really, really not. Um, I have to interrupt our podcast. It's not breaking news. Oh. I glanced over my shoulder uh, at MSNBC. And who do I see there? But uh, a guy named Tim Miller. 
Not again. Yeah, Tim Miller. Who's we uh, were just talking about him. We literally were. I, I am, as you know, an aficionado. Uh, I, I, I patrol the, the outer perimeter of Never Trump land to make sure that they're uh, – You ridic- mean Biden Republicans, don't Biden you, Drew Biden Republicans. What am I saying? Biden Republicans. <laughs> Cat Food Commission <laughs> Biden Republicans. Why can't we be fiscally sensible like we were just five years ago? Republicans. Those guys. Because I, I patrol the perimeter of the Never Trump podcast universe to, to, to ridicule them for all the bullshit that they talk about among themselves. Here is Tim Miller leaning in to uh, in front of a wall-sized picture, leaning in, reminding people that he's he doesn't put up with the partisan bullshit. He's sick and tired of the partisan bullshit. I think he uses the word bullshit because he's on Snapchat and that's, you know, that's edgy. That's the, the, the kids love that. And the wall size graphic he is leaning into demonstrating partisan bullshit is Tucker Carlson on top and Rachel Maddow on the bottom. Mm. And, and he demonstrates his contempt for the partisan bullshit by appearing on MSNBC three times a day, every fucking day of the rest of your life. You want to talk about red hat fury over Senate Democrats? Yeah, I, it just... You know, uh, the same people who were freaking who were freaking out that that Joe Biden might be the nominee and screaming that there's no difference. And the Susan Sarandon people, the Mm -hmm. people who just couldn't shut the fuck up for five minutes about how there's no difference between the party and Democrats are probably worse and blah, 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 blah. They're now branded as hating Democrats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's their brand. This is this is the Glenn Greenwald is leading the parade. But there's a lot of nut jobs with hundreds of thousands of followers uh, who follow and. And they bitch constantly about Senate Democrats. And that that bitching leeches over into headlines about Senate Democrats this and Senate Democrats that, which is fine. Except what they're usually talking about is one Senate Democrat, Mm -hmm. maybe two, Mm -hmm. sometimes more than three, three or four, but not 50. (laughs) And so it's the same thing that the Beltway Press does about Washington politicians. Yes. And Congress is gridlock. No, Congress... The Democrats in Congress are are cr- are cranking out hundreds of bills, and Republicans are murdering them. Mm-hmm. That's the mm-hmm. gridlock. And when you ask Republicans, "Well, what do you want?" they they look at you like, "Well, we want to destroy the Democrats. Mm-hmm. We don't give a shit about COVID or poor people or power grid or anything. We just we're here to own the libs. That's all we're here for. And since you're not allowed to report that story in the mainstream media, or you will lose your job, you throw up your hands and say, "Well, congressional gridlock, politicians in Washington." And our red hat friends are very much locked into that um, mode because it relieves them of the responsibility of actually differentiating between various people who do various individual things. You can just decry the entire system. Very much like over on the Never Trump podcast world, anything AOC says is what every Democrat believes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Anybody Mm -hmm. who ever said defund the police, that's every Democrat wants to defund police. Any school district in San Francisco that wants to get rid of uh, the name Abraham Lincoln or George Washington School, every Democrat wants to do that. And the reason that they say these things is because they have a massive megaphone over at Fox that repeats this. They'll they'll find some crackpot living under some bridge somewhere in California saying something stupid. And that becomes the story. That becomes the Dr. Seuss story. That becomes the Mr. Potato Head story. And that just bulldozes its way into the mainstream press. We don't have a megaphone, so we can't shout back at them, no. (laughs) You know what? That is a representation of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of our big tent over here. Your Mm -hmm. party, on the other hand, is actually represented by seditionist lunatics named Mm -hmm. Kevin McCarthy. Josh Hawley is an actual senator in your party, and he believes crazy shit. Your former president is a traitor, and most of your party still supports him. That's right. the true fact of your party. But since that would make people uncomfortable, it's important to invent liberal threats that are equal to the actual Republican threats. And so Senate Democrats, Gridlock Washington, Mr. Potato Head, some guy in California doing something dumb, et cetera. It's all lifeboat building, isn't it? It's it is. all a way of distracting from the, the, the sedition and traitorous behavior of their party. Well, yeah. the real story is so easy. Yeah. It's one yeah. party is – a t- political party with all the warts and wrinkles and corruption and and whatever of any political party. The other one are traitors. The other one is the Confederacy and racist and, and racist. They're yeah. they're a bunch of white nationalists who got behind a bunch of violent insurrectionists and now want to pretend it never happened. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. the difference. And if you can't see that, then you're really trying really hard not to see it. 
because seeing it would would impose a moral burden on you to do something other than sit on your ass and bitch about both sides, which mm-hmm. is so easy. Mm-hmm. This podcast mm-hmm. we're doing, we could bitch about both sides every week. But you know what, Blue Gal? We're better what? than that. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of which, you're reading a novel, I believe. Well, I wanted to just express gratitude for one blessing of the pandemic. I mean, it's it's hard. This We're entering year two mm-hmm. of lockdown and pandemic, and hopefully we're going to be out of it soon. But uh, there have been some side benefits to being indoors. And, and one of them, it, pe- it appears, is that uh, the mid list for book publishing is back. And I That's, didn't think that would ever happen again in my me lifetime. Me neither. I thought that was dead and gone. I, I thought it was gone. Don't know, for people who don't know who that is, why don't you explain what that is? Well, the mid list is the books that are published currently, new books mm-hmm. that are not uh, trade paperback romance novels mm-hmm. and are not super, super bestsellers. Right. And so you have, sure, you have, you know, grocery store romance novels that sell. Yes. Spin and rack. then you have and you have these huge spin rack, right. And you have these big huge uh mystery novels and adventure novels that will be at the top of the you know and and Michelle Obama's book and a lot, and a lot of words Barack in those Obama's books. Book. People seem to enjoy them. So right. Yeah. Well and and so you have those kind of books that that do very well and hold uh publishing houses, you know Make money off of those. Right. Uh, and then yep. there's the mid list. And the mid list are books that sell modestly, uh, have fans. There are authors that are well loved by a select group of people. And uh, it used to be that you could make a living writing yes, by making these, having books, r- publishing a book every two years mm-hmm. and make a living at it. Yep. And that, uh, Went away for a while. For and I I don't know what authors are making these days off of midlist books, but I do know that uh, there's a thing called BookTube, which is <laughs> people on YouTube who are librarians or uh, work in a publishing house or have some sort of connection to the book publishing world, reading world, who are going on YouTube with stacks of books from publishers and saying, "I've read this; it's great." I've read this. I'm interviewing this author on Insta- my Instagram page. I and and going through a stack of books that came out this month. Mm-hmm. And you know, here's what it's about. Here's here's why I like it. And I'm going to interview the author. And we're by the way, next month we're having a readathon for a week, and we're all going to read the same three books in one week. Which I can't do read three books in one week, no. but no. Um, it's just amazing. And uh, you have to be very careful, though, if you start watching BookTube, because all of a sudden you will be want to wanting yeah. to buy tons of hardcover books. <laughs> I've <laughs> noticed you. this. I have noticed a sudden yeah. influx of books into our home. Of books into our home. And, uh, and it's hard not to order them from a certain uh, worldwide uh, seller. I will yep. tell you, you know, the, the A company does not make any money off of books. No. But um we certainly want that company to unionize, and it seems like the president wants them to unionize too. He's being very nice about that. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I used to dream about um, back, you know, many many decades ago when I dreamed about being an author, a writer of mm-hmm, books and mm-hmm. things. Um, I, I took classes, and I, I was a pretty good writer. I, I published some short stories and some medium sized stories, and um, I drafted, you know, the outlines for novels and. Mm-hmm. Uh, took it very seriously. And then, you know, I started noticing that every writer I knew who was a professional was running in the opposite direction. Yeah. Um, yeah. Getting a job at Leo yeah. Burnett, editing ad copy, getting a job, mm-hmm. getting a tenure teaching job, which is great, but it requires you to, you know, go to school and get your master's and then then get in line and get tenure so that. And, ad- and hope you're not an adjunct because right. you and, write, you won't have health insurance if you're right. an adjunct. Yeah. And then somewhere right. down the line, when you become a full time instructor, you will have a university structure that will allow you to basically that's the, that's your patron. That's right, the person right. who will pay your bills and cover your health expenses while you do something else, while you write a novel, which is terrific. I'm all for that. But when it became clear the mid list had just been vaporized. Right. Um right. there was really no point in me. And who thinking, knew that the and and there was a thought that the internet was just going to destroy reading. Yeah. As well. And uh the pandemic has brought people back to books, and books. that is books. incredibly exciting. Yes, it is. Um, and and life is so much better when you're reading. When I'm reading a good book, I will it just is. tell you that <laughs> it is. Um, and in our so home, I, in our home, our, yeah. my wife will frequently say, 
I just want to read you this one paragraph. I just want to read you this one part. This one paragraph. Because it's good writing, and I know how much you appreciate and, and good I, writing. Usually my toes curl up and go, yeah, baby. Ooh, yeah, look who I married. That's, <laughs> that's awesome. That's freaking awesome. So uh, if you will indulge me, I, this sure. is this is a substitute for Bible bitch. Um, it's Biblio bitch. Biblio bitch. There you go. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd love to hear feedback from folks if they want me to talk about the book I'm reading, because if I'm reading something really good, I'd love to share that with you. I know this is a political podcast, but reading is political. All things are political. And um, the book I'm reading right now is called No One is Talking About This. Mm -hmm. It's by Patricia Lockwood. And she is a editor over at the London Review of Books. Uh, It's about a character who is uh, overwhelmed by the internet. And she scrolls and scrolls and reads social media all the time. And she's become famous as a result of social media. She calls uh, the the world that she enters through her phone the portal. And it's almost impossible to get out of the portal. And what I be- I'm only a little bit into this book, but what's going to happen, I've read the uh, description, is she's going to get a text from her mother that says, Something has gone wrong. How can how soon can you get here? Ah. And that's going to be the turning point of the book. Okay. Well, so I, now it, now you know what the book is about. I thought the twist would be um, she calls someone trash on the internet and <laughs> she gets out banned of the from social media forever. But that's maybe that's just <laughs> that, me. That, maybe that's the book you need to write. Yeah, maybe that's me imposing my condition on other people, which I, I have a habit of doing. Write that book, drift class. That I bet I could. So uh, two paragraphs from this book that I read to you this morning, yeah. um, and, and they do say something about our social media world that I thought was really good. Uh, she had become famous for a post that said simply, can a dog be twins? That was it. Can a dog be twins? It had recently reached the stage of penetration where teens posted cry face emoji at her. They were in high school. They were going to remember, can a dog be twins instead of the date of the Treaty of Versailles? <laughs> Which, let's face it, she didn't know either. There was a new toy. Everyone was making fun of it. But then it was said to be designed for autistic people. And then no one made fun of it anymore, but made fun of the people who were making fun of it previously. Then someone else discovered a stone version from a million years ago in some museum, and this seemed to prove something. Then the origin of the toy was revealed to have something to do with Israel and Palestine. And so everyone made a pact never to speak of it again. And all of this happened in the space of like four days. <laughs> and we're and done. So, and we're done. And we're done. Mm-hmm. And so th- this is just sort of describing what the world that she's entered into and how she really has a hard time escaping it. Mm-hmm. And uh I'm I'm looking forward to reading the rest of it. it. It's been a fun read so far. Again, it's called and and I'm not getting anything for s- telling you this. I'm just no, I'm just no. telling you about a book that I'm enjoying. Love that book. No, it's called No One Is Talking About This mm-hmm. and it's by Patricia Lockwood. Okay. Well, and I, I'm reading a book. Well, I was going to read a book. Ron Johnson has done it for me, so I don't really need to do it, which is, you know, God bless Ron Johnson for saving me all that. Did you see the, the people tweeting about, oh, my God, there's so much good stuff in this bill yeah, like the $1,400 crap. check? You realize there are there are subsidies for for child care. You can, mm-hmm. you can get reimbursed up to half of your child care bill yeah. on this. I there there's subsidies for middle class people to go. For instance, if you're a two income family and you're a nurse and you make 60 grand a year and your husband's in insurance and makes 60 grand a year and you have one kid, you don't get an Obamacare subsidy. No, you're, you're now, that's entirely. not us. But I can see where two people who and, and you know, you're you're trying to pay a mortgage and you're trying to have child care and so forth. All of a sudden, you don't have an Obamacare subsidy and your insurance is you know, $1,800 a month. It's more than your house. And so uh, Biden put in this very long bill Mm -hmm. um, that you're, if you're in that boat and we're not, but if you're in that boat, um, you cannot 
pay more than 8.5% of your income in health insurance premiums. And anything over 8.5% of your income, and I'm sorry, there's a lot, there's a complicated formula. It's like 400% of the federal poverty level, which I think is $111,000, $108,000 a year. Anyway, um, if you're up in that stratosphere of income, uh, you don't have to pay more than 8.5% of your income in health insurance premiums. And the federal government under Obamacare will subsidize the cost above that price. So uh, everybody's health insurance bill in that range is going to go down a lot. Now, the other thing I read was that that particular provision expires in January of 2023. (laughs) <laughs> so Obamacare is back on the ballot in 2022. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And whether you want to keep those subsidies, and those are people who expect to be able to afford a middle class life. Mm-hmm. Um, there's so much in this bill about helping uh, middle class people af- and and below afford a middle class life, because that's what Obama, what's, excuse me, I'm saying Obama, that's what Biden wants to do. He right. wants to make, first of all, he wants to make a serious dent in child poverty. And he, w- he wants to um, help middle class people uh, be able to afford a middle class lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And uh, this bill has so many gems in it that, you know, we're focused on the $1,400 checks and we're focused on the $15 minimum wage. And those are things we should be fighting for. On the other hand, uh, being able to deduct or get a credit for half of your child care costs is huge. For parents that are paying for daycare, yeah. Um, so, and, and and apparently there's a whole bunch of good things like that in the bill that someone said, "Thanks, Ron Johnson, for yeah. reading the bill out loud." I noticed that there's all this good stuff in there uh, that is is going to be passed. I think Biden will be signing this by next Monday. Oh, did you notice that Ron Johnson slept through uh, the evening or missed the part where? Uh, Chris Van Hollings came in and limited the debate to three hours. You know, you snooze, you lose, Ron Johnson. And Ron Johnson wasn't there. He snoozed and he lost. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he woke up just at the time to hear Ted Cruz say, what, we're not going to debate Dr. Seuss? Yeah. And yeah, I, w- I was going to read Green Eggs and Ham again. Yeah. No, no one wants to hear from you, Ted Cruz. Uh, we want to mention that a new episode of our other podcast, Science Fiction University, is up. It is. At sciencefictionuniversity.com. Mm-hmm. So if you're into that or just want to hear more of our voices while you do housework, it's there for you. And I think it's a good episode. Oh, it's, it's, it, well, it does the job. Yeah. It does the job. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. The last episode of WandaVision does the job. Yeah. Well, our yeah. episode of, of Science Fiction University is awesome. And you should definitely go check it out. It's a wonderful website. I do want to talk a little bit about the bulwark. Yesterday was very interesting because it was, it was uh, Mickey Edwards. It, Mickey Edwards was a Republican forever. He was an Oklahoma uh, congressman for 16 years. He founded the, I think, American Enterprise Institute. He founded mm-hmm. the organization that, that, that created CPAC. He goes way, 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 way back. And he and Charlie Sykes uh, spent an hour reminiscing about things that never happened and things <laughs> that are not happening now. And I wanted to introduce a word to your vocabulary call, called prognoplexia or prognoplexia, which derives from a Greek word, which roughly means ancestor-itis or an, a healthy obsession with one's ancestry. Uh, it made me sad and depressed and like, we're not going to ever reach these people because they can't be reached. You know, the garden snake who won't shut up about how his great-grandfather was a dinosaur because he literally has nothing else to brag about. People who brag about their ancestors, especially many generations removed, have nothing else going for them. So they talk mm-hmm. about, you know, my great-great-grandpa was a field marshal under Napoleon. Um, And your father was a criminal and your mother was a whore. Why don't we talk about them for a while? Um, And and that is what I got from listening to these two gentlemen talk about the fact that there was a glorious time way back in the the past that they remember very, very vividly about um, the good days, uh, the the, the good old times of of St. Ronald Reagan and Bill Buckley standing up to the Birchers. And they really, really shine up and glamorize and misremember just exactly how anti-racist and firm Bill Buckley was, because he wasn't, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and how and, and what a firm stand he took against against the uh, the Birchers, which he didn't, and they they kind of don't remember anything about Reagan's Philadelphia Mississippi speech or his mm-hmm. obsession with welfare queens. They just gloss all over that, 
those were the good old days. And so let was- me ask you a question, Driftglass. Sure. Do you do you think that Democrats would benefit in any way from doing that? I don't mean lying about your past, but somehow celebrating your ancestor, your political ancestry. Sure, we're the party of George Washington. <laughs> <laughs> done. Done and dusted. We're done. No, uh, we're, but we're the party of FDR. We're the party sure. of JFK. We're the sure. party of, I mean, we're the party of the Vietnam War. You right. got to, you got to, but see, that's my problem is I go back and in history and I actually look at stuff yeah. and say, oh, wait, wait we minute. did this bad thing. We've yeah. got, I'm focused today on eight Democrats who voted against $15 an hour. You know, right. I mean, I don't go ahead and pretend that the past is 100% my way. It's no. not. Well, so the short answer is no, because I think memory yeah. is what we have. Memory is our yeah, superpower. Yeah, and you yeah. get into really big trouble. These guys – and I kind of understand this. And this is not uh, uh, necessarily a, a, a vicious rebuke. Mm-hmm. It is – I kind of pity them. If they hadn't yeah, fucked up yeah. my country so bad, I'd really feel sorry for them. Because mm-hmm. in a real sense, they've lost everything. They have nothing of lasting value left at all. They have money. They've got tons of money. And they, yeah. can, they can call, blow in one call to MSNBC or CNN and get an audience of 100,000 or 300,000 or a million people uh, to, to listen to their bullshit. But what they do lack is their life's work turned to shit mm-hmm. and their beliefs have been exposed as farce. There's no theory of ex- explanation of how us crazy crackpot liberals accurately predicted exactly what was going to happen to their party. Other than the fact that they were too blind and too deeply invested in the lie they were telling themselves to see it coming, which means that unless they, as Lincoln would say, disenthrall themselves of the giant lie they've been telling themselves about conservatism and republicanism for most of their adult lives, they're just going to keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's it's sad, but as I call them, the these are dry drunk Republicans. Yeah, they they gave up the the demon rum of the party, but they still believe all the stupid, crazy, um, um, self absolving shit that all Republicans tell themselves. And this would not have been possible. The the last third of this podcast was them talking about both sides doing it, you know. Wow. Uh, and 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 AOC said a thing on TV because in their minds, AOC is the entire Democratic Party. I'm gonna I'm just gonna say something right now. Okay. AOC is the best politician in America. Oh, she is. She is. Period. She's the one who scares <laughs> and she's the one who scares them the most. She scares them. Scares because the shit she's out of them. so good at messaging, at sticking to her values and putting those values into action. Absolutely. And reaching reaching audiences that Charlie Sykes could only dream in the deepest sleep of reaching. Well, and let so, me let me just let me just say Mickey Edwards Mm-hmm. says the left has kind of given up on the norms of liberal democracy. And it's both <laughs> the left and the right. And oh. we on the left, we on the left don't really care about the Constitution. And then Charlie Sykes holds his hand and says, well, it's this cycle, this vicious cycle of one side does it, the other side does it. And, and they're doing bad things, so we need to do bad things. And every violation of norms, I'm quoting now, invites the other side to also violate norms. Isn't that a shame how both sides do it? And I sit, I'm sitting there listening to this going – but we just had a constitutional scholar as president, didn't we? The guy who, yeah. you know, might well have stepped straight out of their fondest centrist dreams. Mm-hmm. The one who repeated and earnestly extended to their party every opportunity to work together. And who was told by their party to go fuck himself at every mm-hmm. possible opportunity. Who who trashed him and and from day one, literally from the first Do day Barack Obama. they mention Barack Obama? On not the, at uh, all. Ever? Not one fucking word. Because Obama... Is, is the giant inconvenient asterisk to their entire stupid, lying theory about how both sides do it. Yep. yep. It just negates everything. And mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. instead of not believing in the democratic process, Charlie, who I know is listening to this, because <laughs> he does, because occasionally he'll say, you know, I know there are liberals who listen to this podcast who think, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I do, Charlie. And I listen to because precisely because – you have a gargantuan platform that you use to lie to people. And I know why you're doing it because you're ashamed of your past. And if I had your past, I'd be ashamed too. <laughs> but maybe, just maybe, I think you're sincere about wanting to not take ownership of all the things you said. And But here's the thing. Maybe Democrats didn't abandon constitution norms. Maybe we've learned the lesson the hard way, the same thing, way Lincoln had to learn the lesson the hard way. That when a portion of your country is in the hand of violent fanatics – bent on destroying that country, 
waving mm-hmm. the Constitution at them and saying, pretty please stop, doesn't fucking work. You know what works? Destroying them by any means available. That's what we are all about now because your party is so dangerous that we have to take extraordinary steps to stop them. And mm-hmm. continuing to hold mm-hmm. Democrats to this – well, why do Democrats have to do – because your party is why an did, evil – Why do Democrats have to pass a national law about elections in order to protect right. democracy right. And maybe, from your party? Well, yes. and, and let, let's face it. The worst thing Democrats are threatening is rebalancing the courts, overruling a parliamentarian, and modifying the filibuster. Right. <laughs> Where I, And so I think Republicans should consider themselves damn lucky that Democrats aren't proposing Sherman's march across every Republican shithole state in this country Mm -hmm. and just Mm -hmm. wrecking them, taking the fucking army and saying, marching into these shithole Republican states saying, no, voting rights are going to be protected by the 101st Airborne. And if you cross that line, (laughs) we're going to shoot you down. because We're going to have ballot boxes on every street corner with a liberal soldier standing there whose orders are any tampering with this a right to vote mm-hmm. will be you'll be arrested. <laughs> right. That is what your party's yeah. extremism and destructiveness actually calls for. So Democrats And that's why should, we're on the moral high ground. We want everybody to have a vote. We want to all have votes. We want to all have health care. We want everyone to have a job. We want and everyone, everyone be- needs to understand this that mm-hmm. in twenty twenty, with vote by mail, mm-hmm. our Republican congressman increased his Margin of victory. By tens of thousands. By tens of thousands. Yep, yep. It, vote by mail is not a guaranteed Democratic nope. win everywhere. Nope. And we want everyone to vote, in, despite the fact that I really wish I had a Democratic congressperson <laughs> here in my district. I wish we had two, because we have a, an but overlap I would, here. I will tell you, I would rather have voting rights for all than that. I really yep. would. Yep. I really, really would. And and that's that, that's the fundamental irresolvable schizophrenia of the never Trumpers. Yeah, they acknowledge yeah. their party has become this horrible, destructive thing and freak out when you say, well, then we're going to have to stop it using whatever means necessary. Like, no, 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 no. You have to still no, follow. You the, don't want to do that. That would be have bad. To follow the rules of bipartisanship and these mm-hmm. antiquated Senate rules that your party has just fucking wiped its ass with and laughed at and abused to destroy democracy. Mm-hmm. And they can't mm-hmm. reconcile those two because it would involve saying the left was right. The left is doing what it must do to save the country, and we should just let them do it because our party is is evil and needs to be stopped by any means available. And they can't say that because they, w- they would indict themselves and it would fuck up their whole – because they've, they've moved on to the second lie. The second lie is, sure, the Republican Party is bad, but we had nothing to do with it. And liberals <laughs> are probably just as bad too. That's that's the bubble that they live in. And yeah. they, they they that bubble is – supported and and subsidized by cable news and by mm-hmm. op-ed pages and so forth. It's a lie, but it's a different lie than what the rest of the Republican Party is saying, which is the election was stolen, Donald Trump is a god, and liberals are the spawn of the devil. So we have, we're fighting on two fronts. And I realize that it's much more fun to point at Josh Hawley and say, that's a fascist. I know a fascist mm-hmm. when I see one. That's, that's the guy your grandfather was fighting against mm-hmm. in Germany. Mm-hmm. But it is equally important to point to the accommodationists in the middle mm-hmm. who want to say, yeah, 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 he's bad. We agree he's bad. But you know what? Liberals are bad too. And we had nothing to do with it. We were innocent. We were in Switzerland the whole time. We had nothing mm-hmm. to do with it at yeah. all. Uh, I'm going to skip over CPAC except to say that it increased every. It increased my blood pressure. It increased other people's blood pressure yeah. to just see that that person on the stage. Yeah. Um, and I loved we, – we don't have this in our notes, but I love Stacey Abrams' answer uh, about yes. that. Uh, and she just said, I don't care what that man does. I'm focused on the people I'm going to help. Yeah. And I've just, I've just given that man 30 seconds that I did not intend to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, Mitch McConnell, this is uh, a story that might go under the wire, uh, under under your attention span, and I, it's important. Um, Mitch McConnell's trying to get his buddies in the Kentucky legislature to uh, change the law so that the Democratic governor of Kentucky, Andy Bashar, uh, is not allowed to appoint Mitch McConnell's replacement should Mitch McConnell decide to resign his seat in the Senate. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's to allow uh, a committee of people who are the same party as the departing senator 
is the way he's putting it. So uh-huh. he wants a Mitch McConnell clone, yeah. somebody he cho- he has chosen, because you mm-hmm. know that it's going to be his buddies on the commission. Sure. Uh, and uh, he wants to pick his own replacement. Mark, Moscow Mitch. That is so on brand for Moscow Mitch. Yeah, it really I, is. I would like – see, I find there's a middle ground here because I want Rand Paul's neighbor to be his replacement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's I'm a sure good we can, one. We can find some middle ground in between those two. I'm sure we can. You know, I'm sit right next to Rand. In the there spirit of bipartisanship, let's find a middle Bipartisanship, everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> what was this about Glenn Greenwald saying Tucker Carlson is a true socialist? Yeah, he's, a, he's a real socialist. It, okay. Well, Glenn Greenwald, <laughs> someone put, the, the, the last mask is off, and I'm, I'm, I'm not done, but I'm kind of done with saying, I told you so, I told you so. Yeah. Please, yeah. please, please, when I tell you that my nose is telling me something stinks, Nine times out of time, right. Maybe give me the benefit of the doubt next time. Um, and this week, David Brooks got greedy, or he got greedy and got caught. <clears throat> and I, I, a bunch of people have conveyed to me via my wife that um, I must be, because I'm not on Twitter, um, that, oh, my God. <laughs> This is you must you're... be dancing around the house is what one correspondent yeah. wrote no, me. And no, just... I said, no, he hasn't been fired from the New York Times yet. So no, no he's... dancing. But David Brooks <laughs> has done a lot of this shit. He's got a million side hustles on top of his side hustles. Always has. His side hustle has a side hustle. And, yeah. and New York Times has never blinked. Um, he's he's falsified things in his column. He's lied about things he wrote in the past. He used to write about the importance of poor people getting married to you know, save their neighborhood from being disorganized. You know, poor need to get married and stay married, and that's just how things should work while he was dumping his wife and never talked about that. He never talked about his son you know, crossing an ocean to enroll in Bibi Netanyahu's army uh, until someone said, hey, well, you talk a lot about Bibi Netanyahu. Isn't your son a member of the IDF? They're like, well, yes, I suppose so. David Brooks <laughs> is not a moral man. David Brooks pretends to be a moral man, but David Brooks is all about David Brooks, and he's got a brand. He needs to protect that brand. So he took a bunch of money from Facebook and other people to promote Facebook, um, and he shouldn't have done it. And apparently this is a very big scandal among people who get paid as journalists. And I don't think anything is going to come of it because he is a Schulzberg family house pet, and they don't get rid of their house pets. So that's all I have to say about that. Um. I'm going to talk for a second about Neera Tanden, who was this week's sacrificial lamb. The Biden administration uh, rescinded her appointment to the Office of Management and Budget, and they will find a place for her in the White House. And uh, people who did not support her or decided that her mean tweets disqualified her Mm -hmm. are going to be very sorry that they did that. Yes, they will. Mm -hmm. And that's all I have to say about that. Because she'll be in a position to to uh, make some changes that they will not like. I guarantee you. Kaylee McEnany is joining Fox News. <laughs> Did you know, Drift Glass, yes. that last Friday, mm-hmm. last Friday, the day we recorded the podcast, yeah. Fox News announced that Kaylee McEnany was not currently an employee of the network. Yeah, well, that's... And then um... on Tuesday, they announced that Kaylee McEnany is an employee of the network. And, and they took a page out of Lincoln uh-huh. saying that the Confederate uh, commissioners are not in Washington. Uh-huh. They're parked right outside Washington, but that's not the question you asked. You asked, are yeah. they in Washington? Is she a member of Fox News? No, she's at, in the HR department having a urine test. And then she gets to be a <laughs> member of Fox News. So she has gone from um, low-level CNN wingnut troll to official White House wingnut troll and now on to being the official Fox News wing nut troll. So she's really got that career arc down. And she um, was on Fox News constantly as Trump's press secretary. Oh yeah. no, no, so this is this is not a this is a totally lateral move for her. Yeah. Uh better money, and, I'm guessing. Yeah, better money. Mm-hmm. Bet you. Uh CNN is no longer covering White House press briefings, but you can guarantee they'll be covering the empty Trump lectern. Oh yeah, every time. Uh Anytime he decides to go on television. Yeah. yeah. That's that's our bad journalism report of the day. That and Kaylee McEnany. That, yeah, um, um, CNN decided, well, it's not bread and circuses anymore. It's just, you know, boring people talking about policy and nobody wants to see that. So off they go. Let's jump into a news roundup. Uh, we already talked about Governor Hedge Fund. Uh, potentially, did he? Did he jump the vaccine line by giving a quarter million dollars to Rick, uh, to, to Governor DeSantis? Um we, we know, know that he got a vaccine and we know he gave $250,000 to to DeSantis. So mm-hmm. yeah, I would say that's a quid pro quo. But let's 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 wait until the investigation is concluded. I There's say there's not going to be any investigation. No. Give me a break. Uh Texas <laughs> has decided to go maskless. That's always exciting. Uh they decided, "Hey, you know what? Uh we didn't kill enough people with hypothermia 
and with uh, with uh, dehydration. And to distract from that whole story, let's get more Texans killed by COVID. By the way, it's all Biden's fault. So uh, today, Biden's fault because, uh, yeah, the governor of Texas is now blaming Biden's immigration policies. How long has Biden been president? Minute. minute Biden's and a half. immigration policies are what is uh, all COVID y. Yeah. 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 The um, FDA has authorized Johnson and Johnson's one shot coronavirus vaccine for emergency use. Uh, Johnson and Johnson's initial supply will be limited to 3.9 million doses. Uh, with about 800,000 going directly to pharmacies. And then there is an expected 20 million doses expected by the end of March and 100 million doses by the end of June. And uh, Joe Biden has implemented the Defense Production Act. Yes, he has. So that Johnson & Johnson and which is it Pfizer? I believe it's Pfizer mm -hmm. uh, will work together to to produce vaccines and the Johnson and Johnson's vaccine will be produced in Pfizer plants, mm -hmm. uh, which is very exciting news. The, uh, as we mentioned, the Senate has already rejected uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, $15 minimum wage uh, wage hike, which was uh, to be added to the $1.9 trillion relief bill. And uh, several Democrats voted against it. And uh, their names are Joe Manchin, Kristen Cinema, John Tester, Gene Shaheen, uh, uh, Maggie Hassan, Chris Coons, Tom Carper, and independent Angus King of Maine. Um, all other Democrats, all 42 other Democrats voted for it. So, you know, this is the problem with having a closely divided Senate. Everybody becomes the president of the United States. The Senate voted to open debate on the coronavirus relief bill. It's actually called the American Rescue Act. And uh, the vote was 51 to 50 with our vice president, Kamala Harris, breaking mm -hmm. the 50 to 50 tie. Uh, the House passed the expansion of the Federal Voting Rights Act called the For the People Act, which creates uniform national voting standards, overhauls campaign finance, outlaws partisan redistricting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The measure passed 220 to 210 with one Democrat joining all Republican House members in voting against it. The bill is unlikely to draw the 60 votes needed to advance it in the Senate, which means we need to get rid of the filibuster or modify it. In some it. way. Yeah. As, as Rachel Maddow pointed out last night. We can modify it. The filibuster can be shrunk to say, okay, we're going to let you filibuster other things, but not things that involve civil rights and voting rights. Because that's mm -hmm. just way too Jim Crow-ish for right. us to continue to allow. So we're not going to allow that. They can also just modify the filibuster uh, to say you have to pull out the cots. Right. And you have to talk for 72 hours. Mm -hmm. And you have to have your entire uh, majority of your caucus there to watch you do it. That's right. And if you don't do that, then it's not a filibuster, and we move on with whoever is sitting there. With the vote. Uh, We're going to have a vote. the majority, right. Mm -hmm. The House passed the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. The policing reform bill would ban chokeholds and racial and religious profiling, establish a national database to track police misconduct, and prohibit certain no-knock warrants. The legislation would also alter qualified immunity, a legal doctrine that shields officers from lawsuits making it easier to pursue claims of police misconduct. The bill passed 220 to 212 with two Democrats voting against it and one Republican accidentally voting for it. After the vote, Representative Lance Gooden, Lance, Lance, Lance tweeted that he had pressed the wrong button. Uh-oh. Oh, oh and he, no. he meant to vote no, Lance. Lance, All right. he, he fell asleep and his head hit the button. Uh, <laughs> the Bidening continues. The Biden administration will convert immigrant family detention centers in Texas into quick release intake facilities, which will rapidly screen migrant parents and children and release them into the U S within 72 hours. The Biden administration task force uh, for reuniting migrant families separated by the Trump administration will allow those families to reunite and settle in either the United States or their country of origin. Homeland security secretary, uh, secretary Alejandro Mayorkas called the separation of more than 5,500 migrant families under the Trump administration, quote, the most powerful and heartbreaking example of cruelty that preceded this administration. Remember, cruelty was always the point. Biden said that the U.S. expects to have a large enough supply of coronavirus vaccines to vaccinate every adult in the nation by the end of May, two months earlier than anticipated. And President Joe Biden, ever heard of him? Uh, called Texas Governor Greg Abbott a uh, decision to relax the coronavirus restrictions Neanderthal thinking, and that it was a big mistake for people to stop wearing masks. Yep. Which brought about Neanderthal gate. 
Yeah. Fox News mentioned Neanderthals about 150 times in one day. Uh huh. And, uh, you know, that's their new thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, yesterday, Drift Glass was uh, March 4th, which was the non inauguration of Donald Trump. Uh huh. Biggest uh, one. Biggest one in history. Biggest one. <laughs> Big, biggest, biggest huge. Crowd. Hugest crowd. Hugest huge. crowd. Yep. Four people, I hear. Yep. <laughs> Uh, looked like a lot of failed doomsday cults when the day of MAGA reckoning came and went with no reckoning at all. You just changed the date for, to the 20th now. Right. It's now March 20th. Mm -hmm. um, if the Republicans were smart, <laughs> they'd just go with none shall know the hour of his return. Right. Which has kept the church on its toes for 2,000 years. You're right about that. It's Drift true. Glass. See, there's a little Bible bitch. We just slipped in right at the end there. <laughs> Uh, we learned this week what we've already known for many, many, many years, that the number one threat to this country is domestic terrorism carried out by white nationalists called Republicans. Thank you. Major General William Walker testified that he had National Guard troops at the ready for more than three hours on January 6th while he waited for Trump's Defense Department to authorize their deployment. Yeah. Never forget that. Never forget that. They just they, he Trump issued the stand down order. Never forget that. Uh, we learned this week also that Trump's Justice Department decided not to open a criminal investigation into the actions of Elaine Chao when she was Transportation Secretary. According to the Inspector General's report, Chao, the wife of Moscow Mitch McConnell, repeatedly used her position in agency staff to help her family members who run a shipping business with ties to China. Chao also uh, required DOT staff to help with personal errands, do chores for her father, which included editing, editing his Wikipedia page, and promoting his Chinese language biography. You know, your tax dollars and she at didn't, work. There were several days during the week she, she simply didn't show up at the office, yeah, well, too. She was she? a no-show job. Yeah. There's, there's, no, there's no transportation. There's no infrastructure. Why bother? A number of former Trump officials say they're struggling to pay rent after lump sum vacation payouts got delayed because the cost of living in D.C. is so high and apparently there are no vacancies at the Trump Hotel – and every other boarding house that has a no traders sign in the window. <laughs> so sad. I feel so sad for those people. 62% of Americans support the $1.9 trillion COVID stimulus package, while 34% oppose it. That's bipartisanship. That's 62% bipartisanship. is goddamn bipartisanship. Dolly Parton got a dose of her own medicine in the best possible way. Yes, she did. Yes, she got, she got the vaccine that she helped to fund. The development of the vaccine. So we're proud of her. Yeah. National and treasure. you want to talk for very briefly about an alderman in Springfield, Illinois, yeah. who got shafted, basically. He did. He, did. Yeah. he got shafted. Uh, nice guy, fully qualified, runs the Faith Coalition for uh, all good stuff in Springfield. People know him. People like him. He's a veteran. You know, what more do you want? <clears throat> and in, in our area, um, the woman who, Dorothy Turner, has been advanced to take a seat by Andy Menar, who was leaving to, to join the governor's office. So that's how things work. Um, and he was appointed to fill out the her term, which is two years so long at this point. Doris' term was an alderman. Right. She got promoted. Her seat is vacant. They have to appoint somebody to replace Doris Turner. Right. Uh, and this gentleman was asked to do it. He was. He was asked to yeah. do it and fully qualified and uh, uh, was interviewed – and asked if he was going to plan to keep the job. And he said, well, I'd like to hang out for a while and figure out if I'm good at it. And if I'm good at it, maybe I'll run for re-election. And that apparently disqualified him. Oh, um, yeah. This is this is the poorest ward in Springfield that desperately mm -hmm. needs representation. He's, he'd be an excellent alderman but or alder person. But the ritual is that you don't appoint someone to any seat to fill out any length of term, even if it's two years long, who has any designs on actually you know running for re-election to that seat. That's somehow unfair uh, because we don't have um, um, special elections. They just all – the older people all get together and they vote. And who's voted down 6-3? And it's just such a screwed up system because the all, some of the older, older persons who voted against him apologized to him. Said, yeah, I was going to say – and, and uh, his name is Roy Williams Jr. Yeah. Uh, well known in the community that he was appointed to serve. Yeah. And uh, they felt bad. We did. There's no politics involved with this. It's how we do things. We do not. We only appoint a placeholder. And nobody told him that. And nobody told nobody him. told him that the, the trick is you got to go in and say the following mm -hmm. magic words and the job is yours. Yeah. He was yeah. honest and said, I don't know. I might want to run for this job. Now, this was an emergency election, which means you had to have like a six vote majority. 
Uh, he gets to go up again if he wants to in a week or a month, and it's a non-emergency for some reason, and all he needs is five votes. But the fact remains, this is just stupid. If the person is a month out and it would give an unfair advantage and, and it's some back scratching, you know, seat filling job that we want to give my nephew a leg up into politics so he can just sit here for a month with a thumb up his ass and then run for office. I get it. But this is two years of representation of a poor ward that desperately needs representation in Springfield. And this is the perfect guy to do it. And to say that he he is unqualified because he might be qualified for the job in two years is just obscene and stupid. And they shouldn't do that. But they did. And that's how local politics works in strange places like Springfield. Thank you, Jeff Glass. Each week we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is Baby. Baby is an indoor cat and likes to sit on the kitchen table and chitter at the birds in the trees outside. So he can see, Baby can see the birds from the top of the kitchen table. And so that's where Baby sits. I got a question about Baby. Has Baby no, ever... Nobody puts Baby in a corner, Drift no. Glass. Well, no, I was wondering if Baby has ever considered chittering at field mice because we have field I'm, mice showing oh, up at our do. door. We have them in the front porch where we put out some bird seed and there are little field mice that have come up. And uh, entertain the cats that way. <laughs> it's yes, our they big screen. We call our storm door the big screen TV for mm-hmm. the cats. It's definitely, uh, definitely works. And of course, Baby Eats Freshly Poured Cat Food, our fake sponsor. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store dreck, your cat will sit on the kitchen floor or occasionally the kitchen table and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can visit Baby at our Facebook page or website. And you can send your Internet Kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, or you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware, if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go, Postal Unions! Letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Hashtag save the post office. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job, and it's a labor of love. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Both our PayPal and postal address information is there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Drift Glass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties are wondering if they've held on to their GameStop shares for too long. Hey, let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional F Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2021 DGBG Productions.